Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode. Actually, no, no, no. Scratch that. A very special episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Harkins, and the reason it is so special is because of the guest. His name is Chris Hanna. He's in the band Propagandi, and my mind is blown. This was a person who I had on a very initial list of people I would like to speak to in regards to this show. But I kept going, no, I can't bug him. No, like, I don't think this thing is worth his time. And, you know, just kind of doubting myself. Hit him up over Twitter. Super nice guy. Was agreed to donate about an hour of his time. I'll gush in a minute about Propagandi. Oh, so excited. I can't wait to bring this to you. Anyways, but you'll have to wait for, give me a few minutes. So I keep teasing this announcement and I promise it will be coming soon. It's just, like I said, it's got to be the right time, the right place. It's got to, it's a launch. Okay. So just give it some time. If you're waiting with bated breath, I apologize, but I imagine most of you are just like, oh yeah, okay, that's fine. No problem. Got to do something fun recently. was able to sort of uh, turn a little bit of my year around with this event so I was able to get on stage with my old band, Taken, and do a show with our friends in Sayosin, who have reunited with their original singer, Anthony Green, a future guest on the podcast. Nice little tease there. Extremely awesome, because the last show that we had played, it uh, wasn't that good. And uh, through no one's fault, because, you know, I mean, I understand people may not like us and people may not want to move around and have fun. I get that. That's fine. But this show was like, whew, talk about a breath of fresh air. It was so much fun. And another reason why it made the evening so special for me was the fact that I was able to bring my son, my three and a half year old son, to watch the show. It was his first show. It, my wife was super nervous because, of course, she had no idea how our son was going to react to like, oh, my gosh, daddy is yelling and spitting over people and he looks possessed or whatever. She had no idea. And plus, like, you know, kids are shy. They don't want to be in a room of, you know, a thousand people. But he handled it like a champ. And it was really, really adorable and honestly emotional for me because it sits in such a weird place in my head, that event, because here's something that I started in high school with the band Taken that broke up in 2004 and we've sporadically done stuff, you know, every few years, but now are kind of, you know, officially back, whatever that may mean. But something I started in high school and then now to have my son watch it it was just like what this is so strange and yeah i know that this is not an entirely unique experience like sons and daughters have watched their fathers play music but it just it was weird so but it was great and i was so happy to experience that it definitely gave me a little spring in my step after that show because for those of you that pay attention week by week this year started off pretty crappy but it's slowly but surely turning around as i would expect it to do hopefully I mean, because if it's a terrible year, like I'll just write this whole thing off right now. I digress. Chris Hanna. It it was so awesome for me to discuss Propagandi with him and just kind of find out about him as a person. Because Propagandi to me, when I first started to listen to them when I was, uh, you know, 13, 14 years old, it was insanely, insanely special for me. And the reason I say that is because the band introduced me to so many cool ideas from animal rights, from political beliefs to human rights. So many things I just, I really never considered. Obviously at that age, you're just kind of, you know, figuring out who you are and what you should care about. And Propagandi was so instrumental. I know to me and many of my friends and peers, Propagandi is such touchstone. It's awesome. It's incredible. And the band is still to this day so vital in making some really, really not only incredible music, but making very divisive and opinionated statements on whatever it is they decide to address lyrically. This band is extremely important. I can't state that enough. And that's not an overstatement. That is a complete factual. That is truth. I was able to speak to Chris over Skype one afternoon. I don't know. I just, there's something about it towards the very end where it was like, I just felt such a kinship with him. And I never thought I would be in that place to be able to speak to him for an hour and have him be like, thanks. I needed that, Ray. It's like, whoa. That just blew my mind. So anyways, without further ado, here's my discussion with Chris, and I will talk to you after. Interjection, and then obviously that will uh, lead into uh, different discussions. But the uh, So here I am as a freshman in high school, which is uh, probably like 1996, I want to say. So I, I'm doing a presentation. I can't remember exactly what or what it was about or what the structure was, but basically 
you had to play some media. So whether it was a you know recording or, or TV show or whatever. And I, I think I was doing something on like political songs in general. And so for whatever reason, here's me going to a Lutheran high school. I thought that it would be appropriate to not play any of the swearing parts, but play the song Head, Chest, and Foot uh, in, my, in my presentation. So I played it, and, you know, this is, even though, I, I mean, I'm in Southern California, so people have heard of punk music by this point. It was still like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you playing this? And then I, I think I quickly played Rage Against the Machine after that as well, which... <laughs> you know, bummed people out even more. I, I want to believe that my experience was not isolated and people have told you about random instances where they've used your music <laughs> in places you would not have ever expected when you wrote that stuff. Do you have any sort of anecdotes of like, oh, wow, why did you use my song in a college presentation or something like that? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think if you stick around long enough as a band, somebody's going to reference you in something that you might not even be deserving of. All the way from people's little high school projects, you know, over the course of 20 years to, I mean, there's been some scholarly papers um, people have shared with us in the past, say, seven years uh -huh. um, that actually reference our lyrics. Um, a little compendium coming out that's been co-edited by Chuck D that includes scholarly writings, of, you know, trying to trying to uh, deconstruct some of the lyrics on, on some of our older records mm -hmm. uh, for the purposes of, you know... Uh, like in an academic setting, it's it's really strange. Like I, I barely got out of high school, so it's really strange for me to to see that. But it's it's kind of cool, and and it kind of it rings a bell for me because when I was in high school, I used to you know, I used to submit Megadeth lyrics as a fucking as my own <laughs> as my own work when I was late for a poetry class or something. You know, I'd submit uh, the P cells lyrics as my own poet poetry. Right, you'd you'd appropriate it for yourself. Yeah, and I would get a B, and I'd be like, oh, fucking right. <laughs> You're like, yeah, see, this music isn't worthless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, you yourself, were you, you were born and raised in Canada, correct? Generally, yeah. I was, my dad was, uh, was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, so mm -hmm. we kind of moved around a lot. We spent a little bit of time in Australia in the 70s, but mostly I was in Western Canada. You're in, in Winnipeg right now, correct? I'm in Winnipeg, and most of my um, formative years, I would call them, were spent in uh, just outside of Portage La Prairie, which is an hour from here, uh, on an Air Force base called Southport which is no longer, which has been decommissioned since then. But mm -hmm. that's where um, all of my formative memories and experiences, uh, that's where I, I credit them to. There's so many things to unwrap in the fact that you exist in a, basically a cultural void because it's, a no, <laughs> no one references, I mean, my experience with Winnipeg is, is flying to there to go to somewhere else. Like, you know, because yeah. it, 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 it's a cheaper flight. Um, but then, there obviously there's been so many, you know, cool cultural things that have come from there, you know, since obviously with, you know, you guys weaker than and, uh, you know, guy smiley and burn the eight track, you know, just, right. <laughs> yeah. no, but, uh, I mean, I presume that that experience of, of kind of being in the sort of middle of nowhere felt isolating in many respects. I guess so. I, <clears throat> people don't really think about it when they're here. They don't, um, uh... I, maybe you think about it when you when you go on tour and you and you realize, wow, all these cities get all these other bands and all this, you know, Winnipeg doesn't get a lot of stuff coming through, and it never, you know, there was points when it did periodically, but it's also an economically depressed city. Mm -hmm. So to this very day, using the the revival of of uh, the thrash metal scene as just a just an example here, a lot of the bands from the '80s are back together and they and they go play shows, lucrative shows especially to the west of us in the in the provinces that are tar sands oil rich um, where people uh, make exponentially many more dollars than they do here in Winnipeg uh, and they they skip over Winnipeg or some of them might do it as a, as a fuel stop it it sticks out to people here that everything passes over Winnipeg and goes to the to the places where the money is right right and so so you kind of you start doing your own thing well that, that band's not coming here so let's do it ourselves you know no, no one's coming here let's just Everyone makes their own music um, to some degree, maybe not now, uh, but at some point people were really, really, Winnipeggers were really, really supportive of, of Winnipeg culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking specifically of bands, you know, around in, in the 90s. It helped the bands, you know, really develop instead of instead of having to compete with all these unbelievably good international bands monopolizing the, the local venue. It was all local bands. So so maybe that was maybe it was a good thing 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you had to obviously create your own because nothing, like you said, nothing was coming there. Yeah. What was your family structure like? Do you have brothers and sisters? And uh, you obviously mentioned your father was a fighter pilot. Did your, was your mom like a housewife? Did she just take care of you? Well, she was, she worked too. She was, uh, she, had, she was a travel agent. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, my sister, I have one sister, an older sister. I mean, as far as life on Air Force bases was concerned, I, I look back and I realize how lucky I was that my, you know, my father wasn't abusive to me, my sister or my mom, you know, given, you know, how I see that era now and how I see the the families that I spent time with back then. And my father wasn't, uh, he didn't abuse alcohol like many of the other people on the Air Force. I mean, life on an Air Force base is, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of structure, but it's also not what it seems. A lot of things are a facade. Mm Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's can be a stifling life to be on this tiny isolated community where you are expected to do, to fulfill certain roles. You know, I don't know. It's tough. It's tough now. Some of this I'm projecting, you know, just as, yeah. just, uh, as a stream of consciousness, as you ask me, but I guess in the back of my mind, I, I remember some very dark times for other people, other families. I also remember some, I mean, my best memories are from then too. My mm-hmm. very best memories of uh, life in a small community. But, uh, I guess what I'm saying is I, aside from uh, what would appear on the surface to be a huge ideological divide between my father and I, by the time I was a teenager, I don't have a lot of sob stories with my family. Sure, sure. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's cool because like you said, there, there is that element of getting swallowed up by uh, obviously a system and feeling like, you know, like you said, the only thing you can kind of, you know, sort of retreat to from, you know, using your father as an example uh, you know, he could have obviously just been like, well, I, I hate doing this, but I guess this is service. And uh, well, I guess I'll just turn to drinking or whatever. And like that, yeah, there is there is a rampant abuse in regards to that. But obviously, like you said, it's it's better if from the outsider's perspective that no one sees that. I think, yeah, a lot of it was taken for granted. The, the, just the, there's a lot of presumptions made about uh, social life and social social structure in in such a I mean, it, it's the it's the archetype for a patriarchal society right you, you can't really go any farther than uh, air force community a military community in the in the 70s and 80s it was like it's basically like living in the 50s you know what i mean right and uh yeah that's that's what it was but it's uh, as a as a as an aside to all this or as a almost an epilogue to the, you know just thinking out loud about me and my dad my dad was actually turned out to be the person who introduced me to chris hedges you know, my, my dad was at one time a, f- a fighter pilot in Europe and was part of a, a coalition with, with the American Air Force as part of a, a nuclear tactical strike force. And his job would have been to annihilate uh, a city full of civilians somewhere in Eastern Europe in the event of a, uh, a Soviet invasion of mm-hmm. the West. And he was prepared <clears throat> to do it and has stories about being very close to that actually occurring in the 60s. Life has gone on, and he was the one who bought me the book "War Is a Force That Gives Us Meaning" um, by Chris Hedges, which is essentially an exploration of human frailty and why people why people kill each other, why mm-hmm. people uh, wave flags and kill each other for it. And that was a huge. I mean, Chris Hedges has been very influential in my life since then, and uh, my my ideas have developed from that. And who knew that it would be you know, the dad who I referenced in songs. Right. You know. uh, do, do you think that, do you think that was him obviously trying to create a bridge with you? No, it was, no, I'm not, that wasn't the feeling I got. It was, it was a completely independent discovery on his part. That's awesome. Uh, people change. Yeah, no, they do. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it always, some of the most compelling stories of people that you hear, it's like, you know, whatever, using a person like Howard Lyman from the mad cowboy, uh, right. book where it's like these are these are people who are 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 tried and true in their lifestyle and then all of a sudden you get this one nugget of information and then you completely change the way that you think and it's like that can happen when you're 14 and that can happen when you're 65 it doesn't matter for sure and we often i mean that's one of the things now in my middle age mm. i try to try to think about i was very much prepared um back when we started the band to throw babies out with the bathwater when it came to other people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whether it's just being strident or dismissive of people that, you know, I think everybody goes through it, but um, I'm way less willing to do that now. I really believe in, in the right of people to learn and change. People could obviously listen to your early recordings and be like, um, not, not be able to place you in context of where you are now. And it's just like, oh, well, dude, you're a fucking sellout, bro. Like, yeah. where, where are you now? It's like, oh, you're having kids? Like, oh, man, Chris, what? 
Like, <laughs> do I, I presume? I presume you don't get a lot of that direct feedback from people that have, um, you know, whatever disagreements with you. Because, I, anyways, I, a question I wanted to ask you was because obviously you, uh, you know, have made almost every political belief that you have, you know, publicly known and put yourself out there and obviously have done it in a, in a framework of like, okay, I don't, I don't pretend to know everything, but I think, I think I know these things that obviously makes you a target where it's like people constantly want to challenge what it is that you've espoused. Um, is it, is it one of those things where that, that in and of itself just gets tiring? Uh, it does, but but it's reasonable. I, th- I think what's what's tiring is that people come to you and, and they think it's it's a new thing they're doing. You know, people when someone's smug to you, it's going to turn you off. But but on the other hand, you know, if I can't stand the heat, I shouldn't have wandered into the kitchen and started telling everybody what I think. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, that's true. We've never been above criticism. Sometimes we've handled it really well. Sometimes we've handled it very poorly. Uh, that goes for, you know, our values as well. Life life is full of teachable moments. We constantly have dealt with that. And, and we're just trying to, I think we're just trying to be better people. We don't want, we just don't want to, well, you don't want to become a cartoon first where, where the, where your values are patently false because you can't live them mm-hmm. first. Of all. And second of all, we feel really strongly about the value, even the values we were expressing early on in, in the band's history. Like I, I, I regret the delivery because everybody regrets what, how they formulated their arguments when they were fucking 16. Right. And when the, a lot of those songs were written when we were teenagers. So obviously, the, you, you know, it's like looking at a yearbook picture. You go, oh, please don't look at that. Don't open that and read that. You know, most of the values that we expressed back then to, you know, with with nuance over the years now. Uh, I still stand by them and I want to, I want to live them out. I don't want to, I don't want to be that person who just looks back on, on all of it as youthful folly Yeah, and, and, and dismiss your own history, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really, it comes through very clear to me in the way that, especially, you know, whatever the, the press and interviews you've done over the past couple of years, where it's like, clearly the band in and of itself has become more and more aggressive in the, metal tendencies that you've always explored in your band have just become more pronounced. And it's funny because obviously the, the notion as you get older within independent music is that like, Oh, you're supposed to chill out. Like, when are you going to join that indie rock band or whatever? And it's like, all you've done has been like, nah, man, like I can't wait to just really dive into this guitar solo that I can put in here. (laughs) And it's, it's funny because that, you know, obviously goes back to, like you said, it's not just some character. You're like, no, this is like literally me expressing myself because I want to still be aggressive. Yeah, we can't we can't deny that either. That down to a molecular level, we love loud, fast music, and, and yeah, we, we literally can't help it. Right. And um, we we have we have some good, you know. There's some pioneers that have gone before us uh, up up here in Canada that we we kind of you know, look up to in that way that have never, I mean, they have no, they have zero profile anywhere else in the world, but there's, you know, some metal bands or punk bands from Canada that have never slowed down quote literally or, or metaphorically. And, um, that inspires us, you know? Yeah. That's the, that's the blueprint, which you can work from. Yeah. This, the idea that, that only youth can produce raging rock is bullshit. So propaganda is essentially your first band, right? Yeah, it, it is the first band. I was in a couple of others in the uh, bands, you know, for a, a few seconds, uh, as as everybody is when they first start bands back in the day, when they mm-hmm. first start playing instruments. But yeah, Propaganda is the first band, yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, when, when you were doing these these formative bands, I presume that was like when you were in uh, elementary school and going up to, to high school? It was It was more high school. I started playing guitar when I was about 15 or so. How did independent music kind of start to infiltrate you? Was it Was it purely through metal um or how was that you know introduced to you in the first place purely through metal through the through the uh, thrash metal <clears throat> scene that was you know really really vibrant back in the uh, early and mid 80s even up even you know so far as to reach a, a, an air force base there was you know there was a real uh an underground infrastructure where people traded tapes and wrote letters and i was part of that i was lucky to to find a way into it early on which 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 plays into you know the metal scene was originally a, a very diy scene it uh, in the late 80s it, it got gobbled up and watered down by corporate interests but in its in its heyday which i regard as you know between 1981 1986 or 7 it was very much a diy scene from there our drummer uh, george who who is always smarter than me um was kind of attracted 
more to punk bands, which at the time I wasn't interested in. Um, but he, he would keep playing me these records and some I'd be like, oh, that's pretty good. It's not bad. And then, and I think as, as the metal scene, as I said, became more bought out and watered down and less exciting and less felt less like, you know, an underground community, I started to see these punk bands that had all the, you know, they had all the, the sonic features of the metal bands I liked, <clears throat> thinking of MDC or Corrosion of Conformity, but they also had, they also seemed more like they were in tune with, with an underground infrastructure that was more raw, felt more real and exciting. I kind of gravitated then towards sort of the crossover scene into the punk scene, eventually finding bands like Born Against and Drop Dead and being like, whoa, this is, this says <laughs> this this is awesome. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the, the metal bands I loved in the 80s and the 90s, they were fucking awful. They were doing, making terrible records. And the punk bands were making, and the hardcore bands were making these really exciting, uh, really vigorous and thought-provoking records. So, you know, it's just, that was the, the genealogy of it. Yeah. And so what kind of, what kind of kid did you find yourself being in high school? Were you that, uh, you know, a, a, a typical sort of like indoor kid for lack of a better term, or had you started to play hockey at that time? Yeah, I was, I was still playing hockey. I, I just moved into the city, uh, for most of my high school and I was completely alone, had, could not relate to the city kids. No, there was no metalheads at my school. There was one skinhead. We always looked at each other in the hallway, but <laughs> I was, I was, I was on my own. I was just totally on my own. Felt I had no connection to any of the other kids in the school. Just spent most of my time playing guitar and you know, immersing myself in the records that I loved. Yeah, you were you, you were uh, honing your craft, even though you didn't even know what that was at, at that time. <laughs> oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, obviously, as as propaganda started to, you know, uh, whatever, get out there and, and make your presence felt as far as like touring and stuff like that. What did your parents think? Were they looking at you and being like, Chris, you're making terrible decisions like this is awful. Or were they basically like, well, he's going to make up his mind and we can't really stop him. Where, where were they at? They were never hostile. I think they were probably just kind of bemused by the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're playing in a band? Oh, oh, good. You're leaving the house, and there's other people involved in this. Oh, that's great. You know, you, yeah. you're not just you're not just in your room by yourself. That's oh, that's great. Well, um, make sure you still have uh, that uh, that job at Kmart. Uh, just keep that job. Don't don't lose that job. And that's you know that's all they worried about. They they encouraged me to to try to go to, to school beyond high school, but it didn't work out. And but then no, they've never they were I, they weren't like right on this is great I'm, you're you're gonna make a career of this or something they were just they were just kind of bemused really is the only word i can think of <laughs> yeah yeah to this day they're 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 bemused by the whole thing right it it's it, it still um it still doesn't really kind of resonate with them or are they do they admit the um i guess the fact that this is a, a valid thing that you've kind of dedicated your life to or is it like oh that's cute chris yeah well maybe a bit of both i think i think they're just really excited that you know, I'm I'm still doing this with our drummer Jord, who I was friends with, you know, for, for such a long time now. I think they they think that's really maybe they think it's cute, or they think it maybe what's another word? Charming, of, charming, 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 or uh, heartwarming, or something. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. comfortable. And, uh, and uh, I mean, in my mom's basement, she has these clippings of from all the, these newspaper things. You know, you know how newspapers used to. You know, even showed Friday night, the Royal Albert propaganda with meat rack and immortal possession. You know, right, right. she cut it out and put it on this bulletin board. She has this bulletin board full of these pictures. And it's actually, you know, if you go and look at it, you're like, holy fuck, it's pretty impressive. It looks like we actually got a well-respected band. This is crazy. Right. You know, so in her eyes, she looks at the bulletin board and, she, and she's like, she gets, she's excited that I actually did something with my life instead of just nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Instead of, instead of joining the masses, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I, I wasn't really headed in, in any direction. I was probably just going to be a guy who would try to get a job at a record store and then, uh, drink himself to death at some point. Right. So. <laughs> did you battle with, uh, you know, like any sort of, uh, horrible substances when you were uh, younger, um, in regards to like any dark times that you were trying to, you know, it, it was a good thing that you could focus on music, that it was able to take you away from any bad path you were heading down. No, I, I, I never even drank until, until I was 18 or something. Just wasn't interested. Mm -hmm. I saw what, I saw what, it, you know, I thought the other kids that did that, that were drinking and smoking, I, they were boring. I wanted, I wanted to go play street hockey. I wanted to go up to the gym, play basketball. You know, I, seemed more interesting to me. And I wasn't even really a jock. I just, 
just felt more fun than sitting in a garage smoking and drinking beers at the time. Right now, it, you know, as 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 life has gone on and I feel more prematurely aged by the world around me, you know, I probably grapple more with substance abuse, alcohol abuse. I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know if I would call it abuse, but I, I grapple more with. Um, using alcohol as a coping mechanism now than I ever did as a as a young person. You're aware of it more. Yeah, like I um, I also world weary compared to who I was in my teens and twenties. Sure. You know, to some degree, I do feel emotionally stressed by world events. A lot of people can watch the the, the news and obviously like not actually apply it to their lives. These are just stories that are being told to them. Whereas, yeah. whereas people, you and I, consume these things and are just like. Oh, like that, that it's a weight as opposed to, yeah, just a simple thing that's on in the background. It's a weight. Yeah. And I think just, again, not from my family, but from <clears throat> not from my immediate family, but from the kind of neighborhoods I grew up in, the, just the groups of friends, the culture I grew up in, alcohol was a way people coped. And I'm not immune to uh, being part of the culture around me. So I don't, I, you know, I don't, not out of control, but I, I think about it sometimes. No, well, uh, yeah, I think the, the general awareness shows the fact that you're obviously cognizant of it because, I, I mean, head in the sand and not oh, not acknowledging the fact that, you know, this has existed around you for a long time. And this is, like you said, as part of the culture that you've been surrounded by, then it's uh, it's it's not going to be constructive for you in realizing that this may, may or may not be an issue. I, I notice it more in friends around me, the dependency and... Uh, so that, that makes me think about myself. Uh, it's just it's so normalized uh, that people get blitzed um, still at this. You know, I'm I'm almost 45. Some of the people I know just still cope like that. Yeah, yeah. Switching gears, you know, referencing like your 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 mom's bulletin board and uh, all the clippings that she has around that. Um, when did you yourself start to kind of feel that um, propaganda had become like more than you really anticipated? You know, was it was it upon, you know, obviously like signing with Fat Records and putting out, you know, the first couple of releases? Or was it a little bit later where you're like, oh, wow, like I'm doing this and I don't need to get a job in between tours. Where did it kind of congeal for you? Yeah, probably a little later, maybe late 90s that uh, it's, you know, it, it's everything was a novelty in the early 90s. And it just seemed like it was it seemed realistic that it would just be a fleeting experience in our lives. The late nineties, we were like, we, we realized, oh, this could be, uh, we could sustain this. We could keep, we could keep being creative and not have to depend on working uh, soul destroying jobs uh, in the course of it. If, if we, if we commit to this or, or only recently have I thought, oh, wow, the, I can kind of s- look back and see everything. Mm-hmm. And, and it's maybe a little more, even though we have a lower profile now than we than we have in many years, because of the nature of the music business, the nature of our society, where the older you get, the less interesting you are to people, and uh, just we have a lower profile in terms of record sales and and in terms of people coming to shows. But now I look back and things look way more impressive than they did back in the you know a quote unquote heyday of of the of the scene we were involved in. So it feels more meaningful now. Yeah, it's awesome that you're at least able to glean that from looking back. Because my in my experience living in Southern California, it's like I think the first time I saw you guys was when you played a random show with Final Conflict at like a bank in. Uh, oh shit! You were at that fucking fiasco. Yeah, I think I was 16. I had some show going experience, but I was like, "What the?" I was like, "This is not good." <laughs> like, was, it was, was one of those skinhead central fucking are we going to get out of this alive kind of shows no totally and it was it was it, i i think that kind of you know cemented a place in my head where you guys were i mean obviously like you like we were talking about earlier where it's like you were a lightning rod for people wanting to either come kick your ass or talk to you specifically about this one lyric and you know have a dialogue about it that was obviously more in the minority <laughs> yeah. you guys were kind of just this weird this band that didn't make sense because it was like you had uh, again, being from Southern California, I was inundated with Epitaph and Fat Records and all of these, you know, No Use for Name and Strung Out and all these bands that, you know, essentially were maybe speaking about things that had some sort of political overtones, but no one that really head on addressed the issues like you guys did, especially in plain English. Um, and so I think because of that, it was like anytime you guys toured, it was always like, a, oh, my God, like this could be the last time we see them. <laughs> and I, it's weird because I, I mean, I think I saw you guys the last time you came out here when you played at the glass house and every time in my head, I'm like, 
yeah, this is probably the last time I'm going to see Prop Gandhi. Like they're just, they're not going to exist anymore. Maybe it's just because it's been pounded into my head. I presume you guys like never, and I, I'm making projections here, but did you guys ever feel like part of that community when you guys were obviously like going out there and, and touring and, you know, kind of being in it in the late nineties and early two thousands? Like part of uh, the, the fat records community or part of. Yeah. Yeah. More specifically part of like, you know, that, that sort of like punk culture um, as it was when it started, when it started to kind of tip more towards the mainstream. No, I think we felt, we, I mean, we had a really good relationship with the people at the, at that record mm-hmm. label specifically. They're great people to us, but um, we always felt very, isolated if not alienated from the uh, the general culture that surrounded that whole scene and I, and I think I think you could see that in shows like that show at the bank most of our shows in southern california uh back then were shows where we didn't know if we were going to get out alive of the shows um because the band the, I think some of the the people that would show up to a well organized no effects show uh in a you know in a venue that that had security and a stage and and stuff would show up to our shows, which were these ad hoc, barely organized things, DIY things in a in a hall somewhere, you know, where there was no structure, there was no no sense of a chain of command in case something went wrong. It it was just chaotic. It was it was uh, it was also very exciting at the time, right? Um, and it was something I I thrived on as a young person. I I absolutely do not thrive on that now. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you're it's like to, I don't. I don't want to show up at a place <laughs> having that same sort of experience now. Yeah, I liked it then. Like I, I was very stressful and, and fearful, and it's actually why John Sampson left the band back then. He he no longer he didn't want a part of that anymore. And at the time, as scary as the situations were, uh, they were electrifying. Uh, I I had a weird uh, psychological thing going on where uh, I thrived on the confrontation. Between between us, this this pathetic, pencil necked group of guys up on the stage, and our values versus these fucking jocks and skinheads that would come and try to push everybody around at the shows. You know, I I I felt I felt this righteous, righteous indignation, and and was exhilarated when we survived those shows. But uh, I don't have room for that in my life anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm really glad you brought up that sort of like pushback and confrontation because it, it did, it, it, it seemed like with every every record that you guys put out, you know, even obviously up into your last LP, there is always that, that, um, that sort of mirror that you're holding up, not only to yourself as the person who's obviously writing the music and the lyrics, but then to the people who actually engage, you know, engage with the record on a deeper level besides just liking it musically. Um, and I think that's what, that's obviously what makes people feel uncomfortable when they're just like, Oh, like you're stop talking to me about this stuff because I don't want to think about it. Um, but then how you yourself, like you said, like you, you thrived on that and that it does take a very specific person to not only obviously enjoy touring, but then to enjoy that sort of night after night of like, all right, who, who, when we show up to this town, what group of people have we pissed off? Yeah, I, you know, now, now that you mentioned, it was almost a thriving on that conflict. It was almost a surrogate for. I I didn't think we were a very good band. You know, I I thought we didn't know how to be a band mm-hmm. musically. We didn't know how to. You know, we just played these songs and 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 then tore strips off people and tried to antagonize uh, the meatheads in the crowd. But I never felt back then like we were a good band. So that I probably thinking out loud again. I'm, it was probably, probably I was trying to, you know, get some, you know, replace the feeling that a, that a great band, a great live band would have with something else. Right. Yeah. You're like, okay, I know we're not, le- we're not legitimately a band, but I think we can serve a purpose here. Yeah. <laughs> we can create a spectacle here tonight, people, that you will never forget. Right. And it's true. Like, I mean, if you look, uh, I don't know if you ever heard about the Gilman Street show we played. One time it became a, a bootleg that went around, but it was, we had the entire crowd, entire crowd wanted to kill us at Gilman Street. <laughs> you know? Right. So now we're, don't want to pat myself on the back. We're a fucking great live band now. So there, uh, maybe that's partly why I don't really uh, indulge so much in, in that kind of stuff. But also a little more nuance in my life. So right. combination of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then you also strike me, um, you know, as a person where were you, 
by default, because usually people look at the singers of bands as being like, oh, that guy is the sort of business person of the band. Um, did you like by default fill that role or did you just kind of like, did, you know, did you have an interest in that and kind of trying to like maintain a, you know, organizational aspect to the band or was that something that just got thrust on you? No, I zero, zero interest, <laughs> zero ability. It's, it'll be to this day. I mean, George is the closest thing to somebody who has any idea of how to fill out any piece of paperwork. He has <laughs> yeah. No idea. And it's one of the, th it's, I, it's, it's stupid, but it's one of the things I will pride myself on at the, at the end of this run, you know, at the end of the day for propaganda is I do not know how to run a business. And I, I love that about the band. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I know, I know how to do something, uh, that will sink you. And I know how to yeah. do, I know how to do something yeah. that will, will bring you financial ruin. Yeah. If someone comes to me and asks me a question about, uh, the logistics of, of how you run a band, I, they might as well go ask a fucking five-year-old. <laughs> Truly, I have no clue, right. and and I I don't mind that at all. I'm almost proud of it, except it's stupid. <laughs> right. <laughs> In hearing hearing certain aspects of of you describing yourself as a person, you you strike me as a very uh, stubborn person. <laughs> is is that am I correct in that, or is that just? Uh... Uh... I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Maybe in, like in, in in what sense? Or maybe not stubborn, but you you definitely there, there's a lot of pride in what you are are speaking about. Like you said, you're just like, yeah, this is a sort of badge of honor of being you know <laughs> completely dumb about the way to do a band. But uh, I'm proud of that, and I, <laughs> I have a sense of pride. So maybe yeah, maybe stubborn is a bad word, but like uh, y y you're prideful for lack of a better term. Maybe I, I at least these days I can roll with anybody. Yeah, I don't know. I maybe yeah. I'm not sure what the word is. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm I'm almost just I'm resigned to who we really are. There's no more. You know, there's no way to spin it anymore. Not that we ever tried to necessarily spin it, but it is what it is. Totally. And so then, you know, kind of focusing on the uh, the aspect of uh, never really doing the band uh, from a sort of professional standpoint in the sense of like, you know, you guys never adhered to release schedules. You guys never adhered to like, oh, well, it's been 18 months. It's time to do a new record. You know, during that whole time, you, you know, you yourself have never, you know, I mean, have, have you had to have other sort of like jobs from that perspective? I know obviously G7 kind of played into that towards the, you know, early part of, of the band, but, you know, did you ever have to, you know, kind of resort to like, well, I got to get this other job in order to obviously take care of your family when that started to be kind of part of the picture and stuff like that. I mean, we've always poked around with other things. Um, I've done odd audio jobs, you know, for other bands. Jord actually delivers mail in intermittently. Todd has taught jujitsu intermittently. You know, we, there's, there's always, we're, we're kind of, we're dumb, but we're resourceful. Right. And, and right. we're also, we're also, uh, we don't live extravagant lives. We live, I mean, we don't spend money on anything. So, we have a lot of things going for us for not having to to either push the band in some tacky or insincere way, mm -hmm. and and we have zero problem having to take up other work to make ends meet. Like it's there's not I don't we don't feel we're not ashamed of it or disappointed. Well, maybe George's a bit disappointed. He doesn't like delivering that mail. But, right. Uh, <laughs> right. Other than that, you know, it's it you know what are you gonna do? You know, everyone's got to yeah. Gotta, Gotta pay the rent. Of course, yeah. You gotta put it. You gotta, you gotta put it together. Um, and plus, I mean, we've been. I have to say, we've been incredibly lucky as a band through whatever trickling record sales are left, or through through the the meager tours that we do. Like there, there's still enough people coming out that makes it worthwhile. Like economically, not just spiritually, but economically. Yeah. Well, I, and I think I'm glad you brought that up because it is interesting for me watching. I mean, since I've seen you guys basically on every you know new record you've put out, it, it is really weird to see. To me, it, it's weird to see people pick up on you guys obviously later in your your career because in all, I mean, your music is challenging. Like picking up your you know your your last two LPs, it's definitely not one of those things where it's like, oh, this is catchy. Like there are catchy moments to it, but it's like, you know, if you're looking at your musical career, obviously it's like you look at your earlier stuff and it's like, oh, anybody can kind of get into that quote unquote. 
but it, it, it's you, you still do see this sort of uh, younger fan base that that kind of tends to come out uh does it does it surprise you when you show up to a, a show and you're like oh wow like they're we're not pulling the 30 to 40 year olds like we always do i gen- i generally <clears throat> look out and i do see the 30 and 40 year olds but i'm always i always do see you know a few of the younger people there and i'm stoked and appreciative of it because I, like like you say like with our band we haven't made it easy for people <laughs> despite ha- having over the course of our history is essentially having insulted the core values of every single per- person on the planet at some point or another um, we, we, we've never given anybody, you know, something to hang their hat on the record. Each record sounds different. And that's, that is suicide, you know, f- from a commercial standpoint, if people can't depend on you to sound similar to something that really satisfied them before, not a business plan that people recommend, but it's, it's also, it's artistic integrity, I guess. It, uh, it's just, it's just what we do. It's what we like. And, you know, we're not a, we're not a, the problem I think for us is we're not a metal band. We're not a punk band in other people's eyes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that makes it harder for them to, you know, oh, I'm into punk. So I like propaganda. You know, I'm into metal. I like, like metalheads don't like us. Punks don't like us. Uh, some weird grouping of 30 to 40 year old guys in, in uh, professional sports baseball hats seem to like us generally. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, um, there's two last things I want to hit on before I let you go. I, I have to commend you on the amazing work that you do, honestly, with the Escape Velocity podcast. Um, the thing that I like so much about it is that the fact that, you know, you guys obviously, you know, distill either important issues or obviously get someone that is very knowledgeable about that particular issue that you're talking about. But you you distill it in a way that obviously makes a person who, you know, me, n- not ever spending a ton of time in Canada besides like the coasts, to be engaged with the, you know, the issues that you go through in, in Canada and like to even give a shit about that. So it's like the fact that you're, you're able to sort of like galvanize people towards something, or at least ha- have a general awareness is, is pretty awesome. Have you found the podcasting as, as a format to be, you know, beneficial for you? And that's obviously why you guys, you know, continue to, to do it. I appreciate, I appreciate the kind words by the way. But I, I, I do think it, the reason that we do do it is because Derek and I are still interested in, we, we, we clearly don't have all the answers ourselves and it's interesting to, uh, we're interested about a lot of different things and, and we're interested in exploring them and learning about them. And, uh, instead of telling people about them and, <laughs> and the whole, the whole point is it's not just for other people. Yeah. It's for us to kind of, to learn and grow, uh, because it's harder for I'm I'll t- speaking for myself as, as, you know, I'm a dad of two kids. Now I feel, you know, I'm kind of chained down to trying to be this responsible parent bringing up two young kids in a, in a very fucked up world. It's hard for me to get out and, and, and go to activities or events or uh, lectures or demonstrations where, where there is a vibrant exchange of ideas. So this, for me, this is, this is where that exchange of ideas happens. I keep that, you know, with the intent of keeping my mind somewhat sharp as I get older, instead of just becoming a bitter stagnant fool. I, I really like the way that you put that because that, that you, you never think about it, obviously, when you first started to get into, you know, radical culture, counterculture, different music, that this is something that has to be sustained. Like, and it, it the, the older you get, the harder it is, like you're saying, yeah. because there's all these barriers that are put up in between you. Um, and th- that, that's the one thing it's like, I, I've always found myself telling people where it's like, dude, whoever is still here when they're, you know, whatever, 30, 35 years old, 40 years old, those are the people who are, are engaged with it. And you should be speaking to them because they're going to know way more than your average, you know, whatever, 18 to 20 year old, because they really haven't worked to, I guess, kind of, uh, you know, foster that relationship with that particular either political movement or music or whatever it is you want to engage with. It's, it's not easy. For sure. And I mean, when I was 18, I certainly didn't give a fuck what some 45 year old guy had to say about (laughs) anything. So totally. (laughs) Um, the last thing I want to hit on was actually something you alluded to where it was like, you know, you're, how old are your children now? Uh, one, one of them is one year old and one of them is five. Yeah. You're, you're in the middle of it, man. I have a, I have yeah. a, I have a three and a half year old. So we're, we're, and something that I often, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 34 and so I'm, I'm a bit younger than you, but I, we, I think that we probably still have these same uh, principles in our head in regards to the way that we are uh, trying to influence a, obviously a younger generation and our own offspring from that perspective. Is it weird to like reconcile these ideas of like, 
okay, these are the traditional ideas of, of what, you know, a, a father has to be and a father has to do versus what your own experience was of, of the, you know, the, the quote unquote rebellion that you went through when you were obviously getting into, you know, punk and hardcore and metal and all that sort of stuff. I guess a simpler way to distill it is I'm always looking ahead at being like, all right, what is my son going to do to bum me out? What is right. he going to, what is he going to bring home that I'm either going to not understand? Like it, it just, and honestly, it's like that it, in many respects, it causes anxiety. Cause I'm like, Using an example, like if he came home when he was 14 and was like super into insane clown posse and he was a juggalo, <laughs> while that is a, you know, a bummer in some respects, I'll understand it. I know where that culture comes from. So it's like, I don't know if there's any of those thought processes that are going around in your head as a father where it's like, oh man, like I know they're going to have to rebel, but what are they going to do? It's, it's funny. I, I, I kind of have a, a similar anxiety, but it's, it's what has happened for me is that uh, intellectually I've always thought, you know, you know, walking down the street, see some, you know, haggard younger guy who looks older than he should sort of dressed in insane clown posse type of stuff, for example, since we're talking about that, you know, it's like walk by him and kind of, you know, snicker to yourself like, oh, what a fool. I think I, I'm not sure I really ever did that. Our culture does that. And having kids has made me think, well, that's somebody's kid. That could be my kid. My kid could be that guy. And I'm going to fucking snicker at this kid. I'm not going to snicker at my kid when he makes these choices. You know, I don't, I'm not going to laugh at somebody being, you know, hapless on the street, making some bad choices. It's not, uh, somebody loves that guy. You know, that's, that's kind of, that's what I've kind of taken away at this point. And, and I'll cross that bridge when, when, when the insane clown posse record shows up. But, uh, I don't know if, if I was really going somewhere with that, but that was, that just triggered that thought. Well, I, I see what you're saying. It's like with age comes perspective and you have this idea where it's like, okay, that, that particular person that you may look and snicker at where it's like, oh my gosh, like that, you know, that's a ridiculous subculture. That person would look at what, you know, probably you and I experienced when we were coming up as teenagers and like, what the fuck are you wearing a wallet chain and like some, like, you know, they would look at our, our sort of aesthetics and be like, Oh, that's, that's ridiculous as well. Yeah. So there's that, that, uh, I guess that level of understanding that is, I guess, easier to come by as yeah. you, as you get older, I guess. Yeah. And, and I mean, you and I both know when our kids make even, you know, bad life decisions, we're going to love them to death. We, we won't be able to help it. R regardless of whatever it is that they're doing to rebel. like Even if it's maddening. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. No, well, the, and the, like I said, sorry, the last thing I wanted to hit on was the, um, what other creative outlets do you find yourself kind of like either getting excited about stuff that you can obviously spend your time in? Because I mean, you've, you've done some writing. Not really. I'm, I'm, I think I'm too, I don't have enough discipline to, to be a, well, I actually don't have enough discipline to be in a band, but I also, I, <laughs> I, I've just, we just happen to make it work, but I don't think I have enough discipline to be the kind of writer that, you know, when I see people whose writing I respect, uh, there's a real discipline to it, to making it happen. And I, I don't have that. I think outside of the band, I don't know if I have a lot of other creative outlets. I think, I think, I've, I've never been really an artistic or musical person. I just kind of fell into it. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think hockey is my other outlet in my life, right. playing hockey, you know, which I am equally not good at, but uh, it, it makes me happy. Do you, do you play in a, a, a league? Do you play pickup yeah. games? How do, you, how do you function with that? We play in what's called an adult safe hockey league where there's not supposed to be any you know, open ice hits or elbows to the face or fighting. Mm -hmm. But all that stuff eventually happens at some point. But it's just something to throw back to my childhood. Growing up in rural Manitoba, that's what you did. It's all everybody did. And if you didn't do it, you didn't really do anything. So. <laughs> right, 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 right. I, I always appreciated that aspect, your, your, your band and the fact that it's like, okay, you can be into sports, but you don't have to be a jock. Like yeah. there, there's, there's that dividing line that you drew where it's like, because people usually lump one with the other. And it's like, that's not always the case. And beer league, I mean, there are, there are people in, in our, we call it a beer league up here uh, at our age, but uh, it does attract those kind of, you know, failed hockey stars that you know, that want that are acting like they're playing in the NHL. But but generally, generally, when all is said and done, it's just, a you know, everybody's there just to have a good time. And there is a some sense of superficial sense of community there that uh, that I enjoy. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I told you I wouldn't talk about hockey, but I did. And I apologize. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I really, really appreciate this conversation, Chris. I uh, it's, it's it was a long time for me coming, and I was uh, I was glad you were able to communicate over Twitter to set this up. <laughs> uh, cheers, Ray. I really appreciated talking to you too. I think I needed to appreciate that. Uh, that I, I'm glad we serve a function for one another. <laughs> so there was that. Yeah, like I said, it's I'm still thinking about that conversation, even though I had it, honestly, a few months ago. Just listen to Propagandi. Let your mind be blown by the music, by the message, by everything that the band... They're, they're a total package. Let me just put it that way, okay? I, I'm eternally grateful to Chris for having this conversation. If you are new to the show, hop into the archive. Listen to some other interviews, because if you like this, then you probably would like guests I've had. And visit 100wordspodcast.com. Sign up for the email list on the right side of the page. And the producer for this show, as always, is Tom Richfield, my dude. And until next week, be safe, everybody. Hey.